I want to say this, that um, what makes the church is our fellowship and our togetherness. That's what makes church. I know, um, as I mention often, you know, I hear people say weird things like, well, I can have church all by myself in the woods up on the side of a mountain, you know, and I'll say, well, yeah, you, in, in a sense, but actually not, because church is, is God plus his people connecting, the community of faith. Yes, we all personally connect with God, but Jesus said that he built the church for a reason and that the gates of hell would not stand against it. And today, as I do preaching or teaching or whatever you want to call it, um, we're going to explore some of these things. Uh, for the last several weeks, except on Easter Sunday when Pastor Gail preached, uh, we have been talking about loving people. You know, uh, John said the world would know who Jesus is and who we are by the way that we loved each other. And we find that the very mark or the stamp of the church or, or let's put it this way, the very address of the church, when, what people see is love. It's amazing, even people that have never heard of Jesus, when they see Jesus in his people, they know that they are seeing something from God. And so we find that the community of faith, just us being us, the way that we love each other, creates a magnetism. It draws people. They may not understand our theology. They may not understand our creeds or our beliefs, but it's the love that penetrates dark hearts and draws them to God. The very source of the Gospels of course, starts with this. The very core of the gospel is what John said. John said this in the third chapter, the most familiar scripture, I believe, in the Bible, for God so loved the world. I always like to translate it, God loved the world like this, that he gave. God loved the world like this, he gave. You know, the thing is, is that if someone says they love you, but they never give nothing, Oh, praise God. Amen. I, you know, I, I never tell anybody I love them unless I have put myself in a position I'm ready to give. When I say I love you, that means I'm ready to pour into your life. I'm ready to be there for you. Sometimes we're very careless with the, just using the word love. You know, anybody pass by, love you, brother, love you, sister. You know, but would you stop for that brother or sister? They had a flat tire on the middle of the road and they were out of money and you had to pay for the tire. That's what love does. Love does some interesting things. And so we're talking about loving people. One of the, one of the most powerful things that we have as Christians is that we have been given the ability to love people like no one else can. Like no one, it's amazing. All of the world um, help organizations are modeled after a Christian model. They try to do what we do, but we do it better than anybody else. I can remember at least two presidents of the United States said, you know what? We need to put the welfare of people in the hands of the church because they do it better than anybody else. We need to be pouring money into them because no one else does it more economically. No one else does it more effectively. No one else is able to reach out to the community and have more impact than the church. And actually one president, he was emphatic about that. He says, I just wish I could get money to churches he says, because I'm the government, I can't do what they do. He, he said, I can balance the budget, I can build the military, I can build the infrastructure, but I have not been called to love people like the church. I was blown away when I heard it. All right. 
So where are we to get today? Well, we began with um, 1 Corinthians 13. We went through all of that entire uh, chapter and we got a glimpse of what love looks like. Uh, then we um, got really insight from Solomon in the Song of Solomon 8, 7. It says, many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. Uh, and, and that scripture always touched me. I said, man, that, you know, you just can't put the fire of love out. You know, you know, uh, and Paul said, love never never fails. Love never fails. You know, I, I you know, um, pastoring, I've seen a lot of things happen. I've, I've given proper advice, I believe, and I can remember a couple of moms that loved their sons even though they were monsters. But the mother could not see the monster all she could see was the sun. To her own detriment, I can remember um, one mom, I told her, I said, listen, straight up, your son is a notorious drug addict. We're praying for his salvation, but do not let him stay with you no matter how loud he bangs on the door. Now, I knew that I was just wasting my words and my breath by telling her that. I said, if you do, what happens is going to be deleterious. In other words, very harmful to you. I said, it's not going to be a good outcome. Well, of course, that week, he came banging on the door. Let me in, Mom. Let me in. Let me in. I'm cold. I'm hungry. I have no clothes. I haven't changed clothes. I don't have clean socks. No one will take me in. I'm all by myself. Please let me in. I just want to spend the night. I love you, Mom. Please, Mom, let me in tonight. It's cold out here. And the latches snapped open and the door opened, and she let Drug Notorious in. That's what I called him. Now, it wasn't that I had no empathy for the young man. It was that I, I had been his counselor, and, and uh, there was some progress help, um, happening in his life, but there were still decisions that he had to make on top of his issues if he was going to get better and it was crucial and he had he was almost at that place where that he was going to let go and knew that there's nothing else to fall back on and now I have to face myself and my issues and the mom opened the door and let him in and she went to bed, and of course, the next morning she woke up, her purse was raided, television was gone, all things of value were gone, and he was gone. He fled back into the cold. He ripped off his mother. You might say, well, yeah, she did it because she, she loved him. But see, sometimes love will cause us to even act against our own feelings and say the best thing for you is this the best thing for you is to stay on the other side of that door i'm not going to help you in your mess anymore people say yeah but you know you love you got you know when you love somebody love is not a wimp Sometimes love is strong, and love can see the outcome. And love can see, if I do this, you're going to do that, and that's not going to help you. So I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to put an extra lock on the door. I'm going to get a restraining order. 
I'm going to put you in, in a place where you have to face yourself and face God so you'll change. That's a difficult place, isn't it? Another mother, and I'm not picking on moms, it's just that, you know, you know, mothers love at a level that most men have no idea how to touch. It's not that we don't love. We, as fathers, we love deeply. You know, I have sons. I love them deeply. You know, matter of fact, you know, there's not one of my sons I wouldn't lay my life down for. And, and, and as much as I love living, I'm ready to die for any of my children. And that's my physical children and my spiritual children because I love them. And, I, and so, you know, the Bible says, greater love has no man than he's laid down his life for his friends. And there is that kind of love that you have that you will say, for me, your life is more valuable than my life. But yet and still, with all that being said, there's just something about a mom's love. And I think it has something to do with biologically and psychologically that life was attached and it came physically from you and, and, and it was born through pain and, and mixed with jo joy and all of that bundle, all that whole visceral feeling and experience happens in your anatomy to who you are. And, and that creates a bond that moms had, you know. Um, that's just the way that it is. <laughs> Amen. And God knew what he was doing when he did that. Amen? All right. You know, you might say, Pastor, you're going to really around the bush today. Not really. We're going through the bush. <laughs> All right. So we talked about that kind of love. We talked about the friendship love that David and Jonathan had. Uh, it freaks a lot of people out when David would say, uh, you know, uh, th they had a love that was deeper than the love of, of a, a man and a woman. People says, well, were they gay? No. You know, we we're not t talking about erotica. We, we are talking about a deep phileo, you know, a deep friendship that was so close that um, that no one else on earth or no other person on earth was that close to each other. I know some people say, well, that's just unnatural. Well, there, you know, you're fortunate in your lifetime that you have or meet somebody that will be your friend and stick with you and see you no matter what you do, no matter how you act. But they, they know you and they love you beyond your faults, your flaws, and, and your, and your um, disgusting things that you do. Because a lot of us do disgusting things. You see, I mean, people look at me and say, oh no, you know, I'm just such a good person. No, you know, you've been absolutely disgusting at times, you know, and, uh, and absolutely wrong, but there's still somebody that was, that was still had your back. <laughs> Praise God. You need people like that. You know, uh, um, the, the Bible says that it's better when there's two because if one falls, there's another to pick them up. You know, uh, a lot of people never succeed in life because there's nobody to pick them up. Because they never got closer to anybody where that they're walking and doing life together. And so, and so when something happens, and I'm going to tell you something, something will happen in your life. Don't think that, because, well, you know, Pastor, I'm just going to live perfectly for Jesus until he comes. Hmm. Talk to me in five years. <laughs> Talk to me in two years. <laughs> Talk to me next year and tell me, how did that work out? <laughs> now, I'm not saying walking holy and being sanctified is not possible, but I do know by living in this world that we need to walk together because we're all, at some time or another we're going to need somebody to catch us in the midst of a fall. Mm. Hallelujah. All right. So we talked about friendship on that level. We, we talked about the discourse between Jesus and Peter. Um, uh, we, we find that uh, 
Jesus says to Peter, do you, do you agape me? And Peter says, uh, yes, uh, Lord, I phileo you. And then they go back and forth. Uh, agape, phileo, agape. And they just bounce back and forth like it's a tennis racket. Jesus says, agape. Peter says, phileo. Agape, phileo. And then finally, Jesus seemingly in the discourse brings it down a notch and says, Peter, I've already told you I agape you, but I phileo you also. And so there's a special relationship that we can have with God. God agapes all of us where that we are all in included in the beloved heart of God. But we have the opportunity to have a phileo relationship with him, which is unique between us and him. Now, unfortunately, a lot of Christians, they never develop that relationship with God. It doesn't mean that they're not going to heaven. It just means that they miss out on something very precious. You know, people say, well, I really love God. You know, but have you loved God into a relationship where that prayer is not just a duty? Prayer should never be an obligation. It should never be a duty. It sh should never be on uh, a, a time clock. <laughs> you know, people, you, when I grew up, people used to say, how many hours did you pray today? You know? Or people who just even boast about how many hours they pray. I prayed five hours today, bless God. You know, I, I would say, well, that's good. Let me see how much did I pray. I think I got a half an hour in this morning. Bless you. You don't love God like I do. <laughs> you know, but I said in that half an hour, he told me everything I need to know. We love each other. Praise God. We high five. And I left and went out the door and conquered the world in Jesus' name. But then there are times that, that you get in God's presence and time goes away. And you don't care how long you've been there. A night can pass. A night can pass. I remember when I was much younger, not only a night could pass, maybe a night and a day would pass. I'd be in his presence just praying and praying and praying and praying and praying. And praying. Being there, Pastor Gail could tell you, sometimes I would shut myself in for days. I was pretty radical in my 20s and 30s. And not, not to be there fasting and prayer by myself, crying out to God. I remember one time, I laugh about this, I sent her home to her mom for a week. And um, it, we had moved to a, uh, from our first apartment into a house that our landlord was one of the people of the church. And when I moved in, I felt led to just do some prayer and fast and have my own personal uh, shut in. And my wife, bless her heart, sent her away for seven days. You know, she did visit me once, you know, to see how I was doing, but for seven days. So I understand about praying long periods of time, but it's not about time because God is a God of eternity. You can connect with God in five minutes and get everything you want. Or sometimes you can get lost in his presence and just hang out. Just, just hang out there. So it's a whole lot of things. So, okay, praise God. So phileo, agape, phileo, agape, back and forth. But today I want to talk, and this is our subject for today, is the law of Christ caring and bearing one another's burdens. Caring and bearing one another's burdens. Galatians 6, 1, it says this, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual restore such a one in his spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. Now, we're just going to stop there. Here's the analogy there. You have a Christian that's doing his walk. He's walking with God. He's walking. He's serving God. He's loving God. But he's overtaken 
by something. In other words, this something is not walking, it's running after him. In other words, it catches him almost as if unaware. Now let me explain to you about unaware sins. Now the church unfortunately has a history of not having compassion for people that have been overtaken by an overtaking sin. What can overtake now? We should be, now this is not giving sin an excuse, but sometimes you can be in a situation where you can be overwhelmed. That's why, you, you, you know, when you're, especially when you're young in the faith, you have to learn how to handle yourself in certain ways. Now, it could be any kind of temptation. It does not mean that you don't love God and, and that you're not sincere and that you've been a hypocrite. You see, a hypocrite is somebody that's putting on an act. A hypocrite is not somebody that's been overtaken in a sin and all of a sudden they've fallen and, uh, or, 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 or they committed an in, <laughs> a discretion that, that is against the word of God. It means that there are some times in our lives that a temptation can come up and if we have not provided the necessary protection around ourselves, that's why you need friends. Oh, come on. You see, y'all looking at me like, oh, I, I can just stand all by myself. You have the church. But you're supposed to not stand by yourself. You're supposed to stand with one another. The Bible tells us to confess our faults one to another. But that is something that I hardly have seen anybody do in the church. I'm having this problem with this. Here's what possibly happened. Here's, let's do a, 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 a sin that most of us understand in this culture, and that is a, a sexual sin a sexual sin. Um, you can be hit with something so far out of left field that it can take you out. And, and, and this can be men or women. Amen. See, now it gets really quiet when you talk like this because it, it sounds, this doesn't sound like holiness. You know, no matter what, we're supposed to stand. Amen. I understand about standing. God has blessed me over 50 some years of marriage. I have not cheated on my wife one time okay now now the thing is is this it does not mean that things had not come out of nowhere and tried to get me it does not mean that I've never been tempted people say oh, pastor you've been tempted <laughs> you've been tempted I thought you was holy you know, but, you know, I, I can remember uh, one time I even told the devil he messed up because I was driving down the street and a, and a woman with a goatee got in the car and wanted to have, have a sex. And I looked at her and I said, God bless you, get out. And when she got out, I said, devil, you're slipping. I said, that was not a temptation. <laughs> I, I just want I just want to let you know <laughs> you're gonna to have to up your game a little bit more. <laughs> that was not. I said she had more hair on her face than me. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> but temptations do come. They're always gonna come. No matter how saved you are, there's going to be somebody that that's going, you're going, let's put it this way, there's going to be somebody that's going to draw upon your mind emotionally and physically and you're going to be tempted. Unless you're dead. Am I getting quite, am I hitting it? But, but how, how, do, how, how do we deal with that? You know, now there are people because they have not learn how to protect themselves and have not drawn close to the body of Christ and they're always somewhere outside of the herd of the sheep. Instead of being in the flock, they're always somewhere outside of the perimeters of the, of the faith, outside of the... <laughs> you know, when, when that temptation comes and it comes like a running wolf and you're out there unprotected, no one to warn you, 
Because you see, the thing is, is this, that we protect one another. We warn one another. We keep one another from sinning. Oh, praise God. That's what church, the Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. That means God's people that are knit together, close together, in relationship with one another, where that they have one another's back, where they know you. Most of us, we don't want nobody to know. Oh, honey, nobody in my business. Stay out of my business. <laughs> you know, you know, we, you know, um, one thing that, and, and I'm just going to, um, um, Sister Haste Vandoy, did I get it right? Praise God. Well, anyway, amen. I, I always known that it's a day Ellis, but, uh, you know, but what I'm trying to say, she's a counselor, and I thank God that she went into that kind of, of ministry because at least she can get people to talk to them. At least... But, you know, part of the culture, and I'm going to just say this, and I'll throw this out, but it's in everybody's culture, but especially in black culture, we have always been told, keep your, all your family stuff to you, to your family. Don't tell nobody. Nobody's supposed to know nothing that goes on in this house, you know, and just shut up. And, and if somebody does leak it, you know, you just want to almost take them apart limb by limb. Nobody needs to know our dirty laundry. Keep it quiet. Don't let anybody, you know, uh, and there'll be all kinds of erosion in your house, dysfunction, because nobody talks. Nobody, nobody talks, and they have no one they can go to and talk about it. No one knows. They go to church, and what's really weird, they go to church, shout and dance, turn flips, roll on the floor, praise God, and then go back home in the same condition. Because shouting, dancing, and rolling on the floor is not going to set you free from those issues that are in your life. You need to have somebody or somebodies in your life that you can talk to and that they, and they don't even have to be professional. See, the thing is, is this, when we get to professional level means that it's so pent up now, it's so compressed now, it is so deep now that that now you need somebody that's going to have to be a specialist to pull out all those things that should have been dealt with in normal life and relationship in the faith. Now you might say, what, Pastor, what does this have to do with loving people? That's what the church is about. It's a, it's a place where people need to be able to feel they're safe. I only got a few minutes. You need to be able to come to a place where you say, these are my people, they love me, and, and, not, and they don't love me just because I'm perfect, because we think that's why church people love each other, because we look at, oh, she's a saint, and she does everything perfect. And, 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 and so she, she's good enough to be a part of the, the group, because we're all sanctified here. And, and, and the th thing is, is this, is that righteousness is a gift, and sanctification is a process. Oh, praise God. So, because you've been, God declares you righteous because he knows you're not sanctified. He did, because he knows that you cannot, you cannot be righteous on your own merit. And so Jesus became your righteousness. That's why he died on the cross. That's why he's a substitution for you. So, when you get saved, you are righteous. In other words, it doesn't mean that you don't do anything wrong anymore. It means that you've been declared righteous so that you can begin a walk of sanctification, which is a walk of change, a walk of change. And so, so change is taking place. And so if you're in the church, it does not mean that you are completely changed. You've still got stuff going on in your life. You know, as a pastor, I've had to come up on people and say, you know, you need to stay out of Sal Sally's bed. She's not your wife. I know you's a two-time and three-time and chippy and monster, but you said you gave your heart to Jesus. And so you need to come on back to the altar. I'm your pastor. I'm telling you because I love you, and I see you in your mess, but it's not hopeless. <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying 
so people say, oh, but, but you're giving an excuse to it. No, we are addressing it. One thing that we do in the church is that we don't love each other enough to sit down with somebody that's messing up and lovingly help restore. Lovingly help restore. With, and the Bible tells us to do it in a spirit of meekness, considering ourselves, and this is a hard thing for Christians to do is consider themselves, is that if this person is messed up, probably someplace in your life is just as messed up. <laughs> what? That's not the kind of church I want to see. Church is messy. Church is messy. God's people are messy. But the, the thing that God's people have that the world doesn't have is that they are changing, they are transforming, and they are becoming into the image of Christ. That's what makes us different. It doesn't mean that we're perfect, but it's it, what we have, what we said to God when we got saved is, "Lord, I know I'm wrong. I know I'm messed up. Now, Lord, save me, because I can't save myself. And Lord, I am committing myself to the change that only Your Word can bring and the Holy Spirit can give. And I'm depending on You to make me better than what I am." And someone will come to me and say, I thought you were saved. I heard you did this. And, you, and, and, and my reply is, I'm saved. And God is sanctifying me. And I repented. And I'm moving on. Oh, praise God. Now, that's how we need to look at one another. So, you know, I hate church gossip. And I'm going to tell you something about gossip. When you gossip about somebody, you do not love them. If it's so juicy, you just got to tell everybody else, you are, you are not fulfilling the law of Christ. You do not love that person. Love says, how can I approach this person in love and help them get back on their feet spiritually. I know this is not a shouting and dancing message. But how, do, how do I? See, that's what the body of Christ is about. How do, I, how do I do that? First of all, get close enough to people where that they really understand that you love them. Get to the place where you care about people to the point where that, you know, you are walking with them in relation in life. Get with people. See, a lot of times we don't practice community. And if you don't practice community, you can't really connect with people when stuff goes down in their lives. You just can't. They're just somebody you come and sing with on Sunday and you worship. You know, but there should be somebody. Everybody have, should have some kind of deeper community amongst all of the masses of people that come to that place. Unfortunately, today, we've traded our Christianity for stadium mentality. And this is no slam against the mega church. I thank God for mega churches. Amen. I thank God for people that can preach to thousands of people every week. That is such a privilege. But on the other hand, uh, like one mega church preacher who was a good friend of mine told me, he says, uh, he said that the board came to me and told me I should be proud that I've been awarded to be the pastor of the state's largest church. And uh, he said to me, he says, but what they don't understand, he says, he says, I can see that the lake is wide. He's speaking of his congregation. He says, but if it's only six inches deep. <laughs> he said, so I'm not impressed on how wide, I'm not how impressed on how wide this lake is. They were blown away. He said, I'm not impressed. He said, I, I, I just want to know the depth of it. 
Just tell me the depth. <laughs> uh, he only lasted to that church two years. <laughs> you know, he kept saying weird statements like they kept saying to him, we, we're, we're a conservative um, Baptist church and, and, and you're laying hands on people and praying for them. And he would say statements like that. Why do the Pentecostals get to have all the fun? <laughs> he said, I want to cast out some devils too. <laughs> yeah, praise God. <laughs> He's gone. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say, let me get through this. What I'm trying to say is that when we learn how to be intentional in relationship, then the church becomes a healing place, a place of restoration where that people can talk about their issues and feel safe. You see, you can't even have a good family life if you can't tell your husband what's bothering you. If your wife can't tell you that she was offended about what you said. A lot of men, they lose their wives because their wife, she has to be almost stoic because if unless he is presented from her as being the perfect model of a man that never does anything wrong, then if she says that there's something wrong, then all of a sudden she's in rebellion against his let's put it, authority, or better yet, regime. And so you, 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 can't, you can't live with somebody that, that uh, everything you do is ostracized. Amen. You know, I mean, um, and I, you know, I, 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 have, I have grace because, because, <laughs> I always used to say, anybody that lives with me, they got to have a lot of grace. Because, because I know I'm quirky. I have some strange ways. But the Lord, the Lord will put someone with you that, that loves you just like you are. Amen. Praise God. They'll love you just like you. You know? You know? That, that's just my husband. That's his, that's his thing. But if it gets to be too much, a wife can come to him and say, look, you need to stop that because it's getting on my nerves now. A wife needs to be able to say, it's getting on my nerves now. Now, now don't step on my last nerve because cause I don't want I don't want to have to be restored tomorrow. Because that's where you're pushing me to. <laughs> you know, I say, oh, Pastor, you should no, you got to be able to connect. You got to be you got to feel safe in in a household. It's a shame to be in a household that if you say something, you might get popped from either side. There are women that pop men, you know. Uh, you know, there are guys that get popped, and, and you might say, well, it's just not the same thing. Getting popped is getting popped. You know, somebody's slapping you upside your head, and they, yeah, but he's a man, he could turn around and beat her up. Listen, I don't care if you are a man, getting popped, just getting popped. And it's violence. And, 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 and no man in his right mind wants to be pushed to the place where that he's got to turn around and, and tighten up his wife. Do you understand what I mean? I mean, anyway, that's where my heart is. I, I never want to get to the place where I have to turn around and smack my wife. First of all, then I'm going to be hurt because I hurt her. And then and that one act might put our relationship 10 years behind. Because it may take her 10 years to overcome that incident. Okay. Are you guys with me? I'm almost done. Our time is just about good, but I'm having a good time. The apostle then uh, says this in verse 3 and 4. And I'll go through this really quick. And this, is, this has to do with your attitude when you help other people. If anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will be rejoicing in himself and not uh, in another, for each one shall bear his own load. Now, um, 
I'm going to use two things that, that are important that you can just kind of pull out of the scripture. Um, uh, introspection versus self-examination. This is what this scripture is dealing with. Introspection. Introspection is, is what we do in the modern world today. We look deep inside of ourselves and see ourselves as we are and say, well, that's just me. It's okay. We look at stuff. We in, we're introspective. But self-examination is what saints can do. See, introspection is, is from whatever the um, fad or, or, or way of thinking is, modern way of thinking, introspection, you will compare yourself to that. And you say, well, I'm as good as anybody else that I see around me. I'm a good person because most people I see are the same as I am, and I'm, I'm a good person. That's, 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 that's introspection, but it doesn't go deep. The Bible tells us self-examination, examine yourself. Examination says pick up the word of God and put your life next to it. Not about what everybody else is doing. Not about what the culture is doing. Not about you're okay as anybody else, but pick, pick up the word of God Examine yourself according to scripture and then align your life to that. And so anybody can do introspection. You'll be deep into yourself. But when you do self-examination, you'll say, that's got to go, that's got to go. I need more of that. The Bible says this, I'm not that. I need a change to that. Now, when you do self-examination, it helps you be more realistic and more compassionate when you deal with other people because the Bible will let you know where you have missed it. And when you understand where you have missed it, you are more able to deal with other people that are missing it. And... It brings on a, a what, what, what we say, it brings on a humility that people can sense you're not judging me because you've already judged yourself. And the Bible says that none of us here should ever think of ourselves more highly than we ought. What does it mean to think of yourself more highly than you ought? Because of someone may not be as gifted as you in one area, there's another area in which God has gifted them that can only minister to you. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, I think we're just about done. We're talking about loving people. All of this happens when it talks about loving people. You know, loving people. So what do you do, Pastor, when somebody in the church um, gets pregnant out of wedlock? Do we just go over there and beat them up? Publicly shame them? How many know what I'm talking about? Just make them feel so much, make them feel so disgusting and, and lowered. And, and after you have pressed them down to the ground and made them feel that way, how, what's the plan for restoration? I just want to know, where, where, do we, where, do, where do we go from there, you know? What's the, because the thing is, is that the church's job has never been shame. So you can't love people if you're shaming them. The goal is always restoration. Because, you know, people have enough shame when they do something wrong. They don't need your shame too. And that's why some of us, when we mess up, we leave the church immediately because we know what's coming. A freight train of shame. And you don't want to be on the tracks. <laughs> so you out the door quick, you know. Restoration is what it's all about. Well, do I still get to be a Sunday school teacher after the church forgives me? Well, 
the thing is, the church is more concerned about your walk with God than you being a Sunday school teacher or a pastor or a deacon or whatever. You know, that's all in God's hand over time. The thing is, is that you, you need restoration and we need to love you. And, and so, so we're going to give you a sabbatical. <laughs> all right. We're done for the day.